here. We're going to stand and worship here in just a moment, but I will have a, a couple of short announcements. We had a calendar change, a couple of calendar changes I want to bring to your attention. They're on the back of your bulletin, and we had a, a ice cream fellowship scheduled for the end of this month, March 28th, but we moved it. We were still a little skittish on uh, some of this COVID stuff, but we really want to do it, and so we moved it to April 18th, just about three weeks later, and uh, so be thinking about that, praying about that, that the conditions will continue to improve, that we can uh, keep that on the schedule, and we'll have an ice cream fellowship on a Sunday afternoon, and we're going to have a great time. Amen? And then one other one, big change, is our Answers That Build Faith seminar, uh, which this year is going to be with Brother Jerry Locke, who's going to do Still Baptist, and uh, he's written a book about that. Really terrific uh, uh, seminar from what I understand. And uh, we had to move that also from May 1st and 2nd to April 24th and 25th. So two weekends back to back. Hopefully we'll have some good times together. Um, but is, uh, that should be all the big changes for now. This afternoon we're going to have a, a business meeting. Uh, hopefully some exciting things for you guys. Of things we're going to try to do to improve uh, our ability at this church to uh, improve our safety and also our worship in here. And uh, there are more things coming down the road that we will be talking about in short. But this morning, we're here to worship. Amen? Amen. So let's stand together. And uh, Brother Eric, you come and lead us in, uh, in some worship. Thank you, Brother. We will be opening with Blessed Assurance 345 in your hymnals. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Okay, next we, be, we will be doing Come. Now is the time for worship. Now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you
just as you are before your God comes. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee he will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Good morning, everyone. I want to remind you that it's okay to smile in church and be happy and say amen and just enjoy the Lord. He is good, you know, really good to us all the time. I've truly been enjoying this series of sermons through the book of Mark, our pastor. Uh, have you been enjoying these? And last Sunday was so full of passion, so full of good meat. And I'm reading the text that he will be using today. This is in the sixth chapter. Sixth chapter of Mark, and I'm starting with verse 7. <clears throat> and he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey save a staff only, no scrip, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals, not put on two coats. And he said unto them, in what place soever ye shall enter into an house, there abode ye, or abide ye, till you depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city." They went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with all many that were sick and healed them. And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead. Therefore, mighty works do show them forth from or in him. Others said, this is Elijah. And others said, this is a prophet, uh, as, as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, it is John whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold on John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John said to Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore, Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. And when a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper for his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, and the king said unto the damsel, ask me of whatsoever thou wilt and I will give it thee. And he swore to her, whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway in haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry. Yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought in his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel. And the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, 
they came and took up the corpse and laid it in a tomb. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all these things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And they said unto him, or he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place, and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had not so much as leisure even to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Uh, it's food for us. It's direction for us. Your word is a lamp into our path and a light into our feet. And help us not to neglect the Bible, which is a book of truth, a book about life, a book about what's right and wrong and how to live, and about how to have eternal life. Father, I know that you know the heart of every person because you're clear in your word that you look on hearts while the rest of us look on the outward appearance. And for those who don't know you, maybe in this room today, maybe watching my video presentation here, that they today would consider the truth of the gospel of Christ, that he died for sinners, he died for people like me and you, and that they would come to him. I pray, great God of heaven, that you would bless our preacher today. May he speak clearly your word. He's been studying it. He's been digging. He's been getting it ready to give it to us as a good meal from you today. So may he be a good and faithful messenger and use him to speak to hearts. I pray you'll bless this offering and continue to bring people to you through the ministry of Northwest Baptist Church. And I'm asking in Jesus' name. you to stand. We're going to continue our song service with the wonderful grace of Jesus. 198 in your hymnals. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace, the matchless grace of Jesus than the mighty rolling sea, the rolling sea. Wonderful grace, all sufficient for me, for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise His name. are up there. Are they all the lead line words? Because there's just so many parts to this song. Just have fun on the third. 
wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most defiled, by its transforming power, making him God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity, for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, the rolling sea. Wonderful grace, all sufficient for me, for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression. Then all my sin and shame, my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. Amen. Magnify the name of Jesus. We can't make it big enough. It's not possible. We can do our best. We're going to close out with He is Lord. We haven't sung this for a little while. Hopefully this will be familiar enough to you. Emptied of his glory, God became a man to walk on earth in ridicule and shame. A ruler yet a servant, a shepherd yet a lamb, a man of sorrows, agony, and pain. Say, we you actually do all the verses first. Satan's forces crumbled like a mighty wall. The stone that held him in was rolled aside. The prince of life in glory was lifted over all. Now earth and heaven echo with the cry. He is Lord, he is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Once more on the refrain. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. When I 
Amen. I told you all when I got here, maybe before I got here, that there's a, there's a best part of this deal here, and you just heard it right there. Turn in your Bibles, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 6, please. But Lester has kindly consented to read this passage for us. It is long, and I, I know uh, these Bible scripture readings are long, but it does help us to get a little bit of pretext, pre-context before uh, we jump into the sermon. You have an idea of what's coming, and, and maybe this week I'll tell you uh, uh, what we're preaching next week. In fact, if you want to read, if you want to get ahead for next week, I'm going to preach from verse 32 uh, to verse 56 next week. And Power to Serve is the title of that sermon, and I'm excited. I need to quit preaching that one and start preaching this one. Amen. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be in your house, Lord, to be in your pulpit. And uh, Lord, I'm humbled by uh, the call on my life, the commission you've given me. And God, I just uh, I pray you be with me right now. Allow me to be used by you. Lord, help me, Darren Simpson, to diminish and for the Holy Spirit to increase. That we will hear from you this morning. Lord, not from my thoughts, but your thoughts. Not my words, your word. And God, I just uh, pray you be with us as a church. Help us to grow. Lord, help us to grow towards really more than just growing physically. Lord, allow us to grow in doing the work that you've called us to do. Lord, I love you and I praise you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. We have been going through a, a series in Mark, of course, and the whole intended purpose of this series has been trying to capture what Mark's message is for the reader. There's plenty of ways to preach, okay? There's plenty. You can, you can preach every verse and try to squeeze every bit of blood out of every stone you get to, or you can try to capture what the author's intent is, and that has been my purpose. Mark clearly wrote this book for people to read and specifically for disciples or prospective disciples to read, so that the reader will have an understanding of what it truly means to be a disciple, what it looks like. And he's carried us for the last five and a half chapters, five and a few verses, chapters, uh, and showed how what it means to be a disciple, that it involves suffering, and it involves sacrifice. This morning we find ourselves with another sandwich passage. Last week I taught you about sandwich passages, and Mark likes to use these, and we'll see a couple more before we're done. But he takes one story, and he begins it in verse 7, and then at verse 14 he stops that story and begins another story, a separate story. And then he will pick it up at the end there in verse 30 and finish that first story. And so it's kind of that sandwich, bun, patty, bun, right? Like a good old Whataburger, right? And so this morning... There's three things I want us to see, and the first thing we see is the commission of Jesus. Jesus commissions his disciples. He's sending out the disciples, and Brother Lester read this passage, and we'll read some of it again also. Actually, let's read verse 7, and he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. And then uh, we'll start in verse 10. And he said unto them, In whatsoever place, in what place soever you enter into a house, there abide till you depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, It shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick. And they healed them. Jesus is commissioning his disciples to go and to do what he has done. He's sending them out. You know, up until this point, if you've been following along, if you've been here every Sunday, man, bless you for being here. But if you've heard all these sermons, you, if you notice what the disciples have been, they're kind of been like extras you know, in a, in a movie. They're just kind of in the background. They're there for the action. They're kind of near the action, but they really haven't been part of it. If you remember in back in, in chapter 3, he had called the 12 before then too, and he gave them a commission at that point. In verse 13, it says, and he go up, goeth up into a mountain, verse three, verse thir- uh, chapter 3, verse 13, and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him, and he ordained 12, that they should be with him, and that he might 
Uh, that he might s- send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. And then we see the next few verses, he names those 12 that he called. So at this point, they've really been like extras. They really haven't jumped into the action, but now they're, they're, they're called and they're sent forth. And there's these two passages, there's some parallels. We see that they're called in verse uh, chapter 3, verse 13. He called them unto him. In chapter 6, verse 7, he says he called unto him the twelve, and he sends them. Mark 3, 14, he might send. uh, He's wanting to send them. Verse uh, Chapter 6 and verse 7, he called on him that he began to send them. And then he sent them two by two. Why would he send them two by two? Well, there's strength in numbers, isn't there? Yeah? There's strength in numbers. There's reasons to go together. But it also clearly mirrors the early Christian custom. You remember? How Paul went out? Did he go alone? No, very rarely did he ever go alone. He went with, he went with a guy named Silas. He went with uh, uh, Barnabas, of course. He went with John Mark. He spent plenty of time with Timothy. He, uh, this is kind of the, the model of the, of the early Christian church. And so Jesus sends them out by two. In fact, in the beginning of his ministry, if we go back to chapter 1, he even called two pairs of siblings. Did you remember that? Remember he called two pairs of siblings. And uh, and so he's, he's doing everything for a purpose. He, they begin to preach repentance. Isn't that what Jesus did right there all the way in the beginning? Uh, in, in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, he says um, he started preaching the gospel and that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. And it said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So they're going out and they're doing what Jesus had taught them, had showed them, had done. And they're extending his ministry. They begin casting out devils. They're healing many. They're doing what Jesus did. This is what they're commissioned to do. They're preaching. They're exercising. They're healing. Meaning, they're, again, they're extending Christ's own ministry. That's important for us to understand. It's really important because... As we are called, hey, as we are called, our job is to do what? To extend the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And every disciple that has followed him, that has been the job of that disciple. You know, Matthew 28, we have our own commission that he gave to the disciples he gave to his apostles. What did he say? In verse 19, Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded thee. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. We have a call. We have a commission. Christ has commissioned the church to do the mission of the gospel to take it to every corner of this world. And, and these disciples who he called, who he gave this commission to, the, we call it, we have a name for it, right? It's the great commission. It's the one commission is what it is. It's the one thing that we're to be focused on is that's sharing the gospel with the world. That has carried down disciple to disciple, church to church all the way up to 2021 in Northwest Baptist Church and Rogers Baptist Church and Leagueville Baptist Church and Northeast Baptist Church and whatever Baptist church or church that you know of. Let me tell you, the commission that they've been given by Jesus Christ is to extend His ministry and to reach out through the power of God's Word and through the provision of Jesus Christ to share the gospel, the greatest news. We have a real commission I think about my own call to preach. I have, a, I have a personal commission on my life. I was 14 years old. Man, I didn't know anything. That's, if you're 14 years old, don't be offended. You'll know something at some point, okay? But all of us at some point had to suffer through what it meant to be 13 and 14 and the foolishness that involves. But I did know one thing on one night at church camp that the Lord God was calling me to preach. And it was irresistible. It was something I could not fend off. I could not fight this 
urge, this desire to preach, this commission on my life. I can tell you there are a lot of better things that we could do with our lives than give our, give our time towards the preaching of the gospel, aren't there? I mean, here in our present day and age, there's wealth available. There is comforts galore. There are pleasures at any turn and any, any place we can seek them. They're all over the place. And seemingly, to our flesh, there's plenty of opportunities to enjoy ourselves in other ways. Let me tell you, there's no better way than to spend your life serving and following the commission that God has given us. I had a friend, I have a friend, his name is Jamie Smith, he was a pastor for a number of years, he actually performed Melissa and I's wedding, and when I was younger, and, and let me tell you, the call of, of God on you, uh, it makes you a target, it really does, it will make you a target, and the devil is going to try to unsettle you from that, and he did that through my teenage years and in my 20s some, and I remember sharing the uncertainties that I had about my own call, and I shared some of that with Jamie, my friend Jamie. And Jamie told me something I'll never forget. I've shared this with Brother Lester, and he's probably had a similar story told to him. Jamie told me, Darren, if God has truly called you to preach, you'll never be happy doing anything else. And I found that out because I tried to do other stuff. And guess what? I was absolutely miserable. Let me tell you, that doesn't, I'm talking about my own personal call, but you, Northwest Baptist Church, as members of this church, are never going to be truly fulfilled in the ministry of Northwest Baptist Church unless you are doing what God has called you to do. We have to grab hold of this commission and grab it and go. We must give ourselves completely to this. Now, of course, in this passage we've read in Mark, these first few verses uh, where, where Jesus is commissioning the twelve, there are some hints that of opposition that's going to come because of their commission. You know, there has been hints about opposition all through this, uh, this book so far. If you remember, uh, the ministry of Jesus began right there in, 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 in Mark 1, verses 16 through 20, a really good passage. We get to see the beginning of his ministry. But what follows immediately? Opposition. Immediately after that, we see uh, the opposition of a demon in in, in Chapter 1, verse 23 and 24. Or what about the exorcism that we see Jesus uh, do in Mark chapter 3? A wonderful, a wonderful story, okay? Where Jesus steps in and he, he rescues this man from demon possession. But what happens? What follows immediately? Opposition. Opposition. We see it from the scribes in, in chapter 3, verse 22 through 30. We read about that, remember? And they said that, he was doing it by the power of devils. He, must have, he was out of his mind, is what they said. He experienced opposition. And then here, in this story, we see the commission of the twelve and the hint of opposition. And so the second thing we see today, uh, besides the commission, is the opposition. What we see next is the opposition. We see the hostility that John faced. Brother Lester read this whole passage. I'm not going to read all of it. But there's some interesting parallels to the story of Herod. Uh, in John the Baptist, uh, we could I could parallel the story, uh, uh, this the, the two kings that are in this story. There's two kings in this story. Did you know that? In this passage, we have two kings. We have King Herod, an earthly king, and then we have King Jesus, a almighty, all sovereign king. We see King Herod, the life taking king, and we see King we see King Jesus, the life giving king. Or we could compare Jairus' daughter to, from the previous passage that we were in last week. We, we see Jairus' daughter. Well, there's a daughter in this story too. Well, there's lots of parallels between Jairus' daughter and Herodias' daughter. Or we can compare Herodias and John versus Jezebel and Elijah. Two very similar guys, two very similar situations. And there's plenty of comparisons we could draw. We could even compare the suffering of John the Baptist under Herod to the suffering of Jesus under Pontius Pilate. I mean, think about it. We have two reluctant uh, rulers. They were both dealing with something during a feast time or during a feast. You know, Herod had a party taking place and, and uh, Pilate was governing during a time of feast. The rulers are both afraid of the accused. <laughs> Herod respect. If you read that and paid attention to what Brother Lester was reading, You'll see that Herod really respected John. He feared him. He said he was a just man. He was holy. 
Well, how did Pilate feel about, feel about Jesus? He believed he was innocent and that he was not guilty of what he was being accused of, that he was, in a sense, righteous. They're both referred to as Elijah in these respective stories. And they're both buried in tombs by their disciples. There's a lot of comparisons we could make, and there's a lot of interesting things I could preach about from this story about the beheading of John the Baptist. But the point that Mark is wanting to make to the reader about this grisly murder of John the Baptist is that it is an example of the kind of danger a disciple of Christ may face. You know, we've, we've talked about much of the danger that the, exam, uh, that the disciple of Christ may face. We've seen uh, uh, worldly opposition. We've seen material opposition. We've seen uh, demonic opposition. We've seen that all through this uh, book that we've been studying and preaching and reading about. But here we see how extreme it could get. John. John the Baptist. This is a grisly account. This is terrible what takes place. I mean, this daughter, this daughter of Herodias asks for John's head on a plate. I mean, how more disgusting and grisly can you get? But this is the kind of opposition that the called of God may actually face. You know, we live in America, praise the Lord. We live in America, and while we may complain about the political climate and, and things that we think are going wrong that we wish were different, we have it so good. We are so incredibly blessed. And we have unbelievable freedom still, tremendous freedom, to continue to do what Christ has called us to do, con to continue in the work of fulfilling the Great Commission. We have, tremendous, we have tremendous freedom to do that. But we may face real dangers on this mission. You know, this church may face uh, legal repercussions if the, some laws change and we decide to stay true to God's word. You know, there's plenty of talk about wanting to change the sort of things that I'm allowed to say in the pulpit. And we may face real legal repercussions. I could end up in jail. We laugh about that and we joke about that, but th that's the truth. I could totally end up in jail. I could be all over the, nine, the 10 o'clock news talking about this horrible pastor who has these opinions that are biblical. They label me as using hate speech, whatever they want to attach to it. We have tremendous freedom, but there are real dangers we may face. You know, most, most of the dangers that we may face are really pretty petty, but they work, don't they? We'll find circumstantial, uh, circumstantial problems in our life that uh, get our focus off of the fulfilling the commission and get our focus on our own problems and our own concerns and our own comforts and our own luxuries and our own pleasures. Lord, man, the devil wants to keep us in that trap. He wants to keep us right there. Wednesday night, if you weren't here, many of you weren't, and that's okay, or y'all were serving in master clubs, praise the Lord. I talked about how Paul had one thing. He had a one thing that he, was, that he was focused on, and that was Jesus Christ. Knowing his Jesus, following his Jesus, serving his Jesus, and all the other stuff, he said, I count them but dung. Well, if you don't know what that means, just imagine it for a little bit and remember what dung means, okay? It was garbage, refuse of the most filthy kind. He said, I put that stuff behind me, and I pressed towards the mark, the high calling, of Jesus Christ, that's what we're to do. But the devil wants to take whatever circumstances he can. He wants to give us whatever opposition he can and try to suppress this commission that Christ has given us. He wants to get us off of the path. We're going to face real dangers. And the more that we persevere, if you look at the life of Paul, Paul was wonderfully effective in his ministry. And he reached and planted so many churches. And he reached so many people. And I believe he baptized probably hundreds, maybe thousands of men. But listen, the opposition that he faced, did it get lesser and lesser? No, not at all. It got worse and worse and worse and worse until finally they took his head. Listen, the disciple of Christ who's seeking to follow the commission of Christ 
faces real danger on the mission. R.T. France <clears throat> has a quote I'm going to share with you. He said, there's a basic conflict of, of interests, even of ideologies, between the kingdom of God and the norms of human society. An ambassador of the kingdom of God is called not only to a mission of restoration and deliverance, but also to a conflict of which John's fate provides an extreme example. To follow Christ is to follow him into conflict. But that is what we are called to do. That's what his disciples were commissioned to do. And Mark here is masterfully... By the way, Mark was not a fool, okay? He was not just writing down his recollections in a diary. He crafted this book specifically to identify and to share these specific truths with us so that when a, when a disciple reads this, they understand the kind of dangers that they face. That, that there's a conflict of interest with what Christ wants to do in this world and what the world wants to do. And that's going to be conflict. But my sermon title this morning is called Provision for Persecution if you saw that title in the, in, the, in the bulletin and thought, that's kind of a strange title. It's like God is provisioning people to persecute you. No, not exactly. There is, we see the commission, we see the opposition, and then we see God's provision to endure. The divine provision for the mission, let's read those in verse 8 and 9. <clears throat> He commanded them, after he called them, sent them two by two, gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no scrip, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals and not put on two coats or two tunics. And then we go to the last of this story, those last few verses, verse 30. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught, and he said to them, Come you yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. <clears throat> and they departed into a desert place by ship privately. It may not be abundantly obvious from these verses I've just read, but Christ provides for those on his mission. You know, it's strange we see the provision that, we, that he commanded them to take with them. In verses 8 and 9, he said that they shouldn't take anything for their journey. Don't pack your bags, all right? Don't put any extra gas in the tank. You just go, okay? Don't even uh, take, just take a staff. Don't take any food with you, no snacks for the road, no money in your pocket, and just wear your sandals and a, and a tunic. That's it. It doesn't seem like a lot, does it? Well, it's kind of a strange dress code, isn't it? But this kind of recounts the same dress of the Exodus generation. You know, when they entered it out of, when they left Egypt, they weren't exactly clothed with many clothes, and they didn't exactly have a lot of gaps and, and, and old navy stores to visit along the way for 40 years, did they? No, not at all. They, they, they did leave with spoils, but their clothes had to last them those 40 years. Deuteronomy 29.5, it says, And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxen old upon you, and thy shoe is not waxen old upon thy foot. Listen, God provides. God provides exactly what, he is, what is needed. These guys didn't have need to carry and, and con, all these consumables. They were to rely on God's provision. They were to rely on Jesus' ability to take care of them. You know, Jesus was with them. When we, if, we were go back, if we were to go back to when he called them, when we called them out, the 12 among his disciples in Mark 3.14, it says, it says uh, verse 14, And he adorn, ordained the 12 that they should be with him that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth. Jesus was with them. They were to be with Jesus. And that kind of seems contradictory now, that, though, that he's sending them away from him, right? But there is no contradiction. Jesus was with them. He was there. Even as they were sent, they were with him. They couldn't do anything without him. He's God. He's, he's the true Messiah. They're extending his ministry. 
John 15, 5, it says, For with me you can do nothing. They had to be with him. Jesus was with them. Even with this strange dress code, God is providing. Jesus is with them. But Mark, uh, this last passage we read in verses 30 through 32. Well, it, it was more than just a simple regathering of the disciples to their master. It's more than that. They, they came and they gave a report. And what was their report? Success. There, there may have been more to report that we don't have here, but we saw earlier that they had, they had done great things. They had uh, preached that men should repent. They cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick. In fact, that kind of contrasts what we see at the beginning of the chapter where Jesus in his own country was only able to, uh, to save a few on a few f- sick folk in his country. They were successful. But not only was this a time to report, it was a time... Uh, where we see Jesus' tenderness on the calling of his of the called of his disciples. It's a moment of tenderness where Jesus calls them and he says, they're, they're freshly returned from their recent sending, their labors, and he calls them to come away and rest. The lesson in all of this is, is simple. Jesus' provision goes with his disciples. It goes with us. I talk about our own commission. We have a real job to do. And, and that often gets lost when we play American church. It really does. We get into habits. We get into routines. This Sunday routine becomes very familiar. And it's like we're at home. So we're so comfortable we can sit in the pew and nod off a little bit sometimes. No, not y'all. Not y'all. But other churches. We get comfortable. When we start doing God's work, we're going to find opposition. Maybe circumstances. It may be something unlooked for. It may be come from within our own walls. But Jesus' divine provision is with us. It's with us. These disciples weren't called to retire now that their tour was over, by the way. Their, their, their tour of work, their, their time to go out and be sent was not over. They weren't called to say, okay, now your time is up. Put your feet up. You've done, you've done what you need to do. It's somebody else's job now. No. They're encouraged to receive restoration, rest, and encouraged by Jesus to keep on going, as are all of us. God provides for us. He provides for the mission we have here today. He's provided for this church very generously. I mean, there ought to be more amens. God has blessed this church tremendously. And he's given us provisions to do his work. He's provided the freedom He's provided the energy. He's provided the knowledge and the ability. And God bless him, he's provided the resources. But now it's our job to grab hold of his commission and to do it. How are we to do this, Darren? How are we to do this? What are we supposed to do? Listen, we need to engage God's mission with God's provision. We're to engage God's mission. We're to get involved. We're to apply ourselves to what God might have us to do. It might be you need to be a nursery worker. It might be that you need to share the gospel with your neighbor. It may be that you need to to invite your friend from work to church. We need to engage, though, in his mission. We need to get with it. And notice... Opposition may really come. You know, John preached, and he was rejected, but now he's been killed. Well, what about Jesus? Jesus is preached, uh, is preached. He's been rejected, and his death is coming. In fact, spoiler in Mark 9, verses 12 and 13, it says, Elias verily com- cometh first, and restoreth all things. 
and how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. But I say unto you that Elias has indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, <coughs> as it is written of him. What that's saying is, is that Jesus was going to experience the same kind of persecution that Elijah experienced. Excuse me. Now we see the disciples have preached. What might have happened to them has now been pictured for the reader. Yet what? God's provision is sufficient. They must continue on with the mission as all who follow. So again, we must engage God's mission with God's provision. I love that great commission Excuse me. They are weighty words, convicting to read. I read them shortly before you, uh, just just a moment ago, where he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. But the reason why I like to read this and I left a verse out, as you know. It's because of verse 18. He says, before he says all of that other stuff, before he gives them this incredible weight of responsibility to share the gospel with the world, the hope of salvation, and to teach the gospel and to share the word, he says something very critical and important to his disciples. He says, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. You know, there's all kinds of powers in this world, and we rely on a lot of them, don't we? There's the power of our own American freedom for us to do how we and, and, and behave the way we wish. There's the power of the resources that we have to, you know, pay our bills and and enjoy vacations and leisure and retirement and whatever things. There's the power we have that God gives us through this body that allows us to go and and to come and to do things and to learn new things and experience new things. There's all kinds of powers, but there's only one power that is above all powers, and that's the power of God. He's the power through which all powers flow. He's the the reason why we have this body. He's the reason why we have these resources. He's the reason why we have this freedom. And because of those things, what does he say? Go, you therefore. I've given you all the, I have all the power and I've given you the power you need to go, therefore, and teach. We must engage God's mission with God's provision. We have a weighty responsibility, as I said, to share the gospel. The gospel. (laughs) What is the gospel, Darren? It's the hope of salvation. It's the thing that all of us need. It's where Christ supplied for all, all of our greatest need, the need of a Savior. We all face eternity. God did not make us... Uh, to be annihilated and and to experience no more at at the end of this body. This body will die. It is appointed unto man once to die. And he's speaking about your bodily death. But after this, what? The judgment. We all face eternity. The question is where? Are you going to experience it forever in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? in the new creation that he makes, in his new kingdom, in the new world that he makes, and experience whatever is going to take place in all of uh, eternity beyond, in utter joy and peace and happiness with him? Or are you going to be like the millions and billions who have rejected him? And going to experience eternal separation from him? There may be one here today who's never trusted Christ as their Savior. Let me tell you, today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Brother Lester, we were talking uh, last night a little bit, and we were talking about uh, daylight savings time. And he shared with me, man, a great quip. i got to write this down. I'm going to. He said he's been hoping to preach a message during daylight savings weekend that says there's uh, less time than you think there is. How true is that? You've got less time than you think you do. 
And that's not just for I mean, that's not just for unbelievers. If you're here and you've never trusted Christ, you have less time than you think you do. We're not guaranteed one more second. There's been plenty people you've known or heard of who've just dropped dead, completely healthy, and nothing could be done. And they've entered into eternity with no more opportunity to make this decision about Christ. Let me tell you, it's serious. It's more serious than a heart attack. I mean, this is life and death on an eternal scale. Let me tell you, church members, we have less time than we think we do. For us to do what Christ has called us to do, there's less, there's less time than we think we have to share, to give, to serve, to teach, to reach the world. There's no guarantee on how long Northwest Baptist Church is going to last. None. None. We're going to do what we can to serve the Lord and glorify Him as best as we can. We're going to make use of the resources that He's given, and we're going to prayerfully apply those to the reaching of this community around us and to the missions that we have out on the field. But there's no guarantee that God is going to bring a harvest to us and going to fill these doors. None whatsoever. But if only one gets saved in the next five years, it's going to be worth every single bit There's no guarantee of how much time we have left. Let's engage God's mission with God's provision. Let's stand together. We're going to have a short time of invitation. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you, if there's, if there's one who needs to come, we have an altar. I, I said this a few weeks ago. I'm the pastor of this church, and so I'm the pastor of this altar, and now we can use it. I'm going to tell you, it's okay. If you need to come and pray, come and pray. Talk to the Lord. If you need to do business with Him, you can do it right where you're at. But let me implore you, if God is working on you, if He's, if he's talking to you, first off, don't tune Him out. And if He's talking to you, it's for a purpose He wants you to respond do not leave today without responding to the Lord. Do what He calls. Listen and follow as He bids. <clears throat> Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank You for this day. Lord, you've been so good to us and you've blessed us with your word, clearly shares to us what life for a disciple should be about. And Lord, that we do not go alone, that we do not face the dangers of this world and the opposition and the conflict that we're going to face, we don't face that alone, that you go with us. And you provide for us. We may not be wealthy. We may not always be comfortable. But God, we'll have what we need to do your will. Lord, I pray. I pray for Northwest Baptist Church. Lord, help us to unify under the Great Commission. Help each of us to take ownership of it and apply ourselves in how you might have us to serve. Lord, last I pray for those who may be here who may not have trusted Christ. Lord, help them to see the reality of their condition, to see the opportunity of their Savior who's died for them and only requests that they turn from this world and trust Him. God, I pray uh, you just bless us today. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your love and your care. We thank you for your provision. We ask you bless us in Christ's name. Amen. The service is over, but the invitation...